I got my own theme song, which is pretty freaking awesome, right? I know. I was like, I was really psyched about that. It was actually Mike. Mike's one of the speakers tonight. He's like, you know, if you do this in the future, you should get a theme song. And then Paul back there is like, you can have a theme song. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Uh, so I, uh, it's a real thrill for me to be here. I love Kiggins Theater. It's such an amazing place with so much history. Um, I really want to thank, um, I really want to thank the Kiggins owners for opening this up uh, to us and for letting me be part of this. And, and thank you all so much for being here. And and, um, and kind of joining us here tonight. So I, since they selected me to come and talk at Van Talks, have tried to figure out why. <laughs> I mean, I know why I wanted to do it, but I seriously had no idea because everyone tonight, their, their stories are so inspirational. Um, and I heard Nate's and I've heard, and his stuff is just so great and everyone is just like one after the other, really inspirational. And I figured out why I am here. And that is, I am the sorbet. I am, well, and we, right, we have sorbet to cleanse the palate. And so that's, I am your sorbet. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so we all have to have a purpose. Um, but anyway, so let's talk about energy. Energy is awesome, I love energy. As a matter of fact, I have seven of these shirts hanging up in my closet. I am always ready to go, always ready to talk. Um, so, but I wasn't always like this. Uh, as a matter of fact, and my wardrobe wasn't always this monochromatic. I, uh, I, I want you to journey with me now back 30 years, clear your mind's eye, 30 years back to 1992, where a young, impressionable Kurt Miller with golden locks <laughs> and dreamy blue eyes. <laughs> Shut up, it's my flashback. So, dreamy blue eyes, <laughs> had just graduated uh, with a degree in economics from Willamette University in Salem. And I was a class salutatorian, which is a thing. Uh, and you can look it up when you get home. But uh, I was ready, I really was, I was ready to take on the world. I was so excited, I was ready to start my career, but there was a rub. And that rub was, in 1992, there was a recession. Um, and so people weren't getting job offers. My classmates weren't getting job offers. They weren't getting job interviews. Um, and this is a time back in 1992, some of you may remember this, it was actually embarrassing to live at home with your parents after you graduated from school. So I know now it's a lifestyle choice, <laughs> right? But back then it was like, ooh, right? You know, what's wrong with you? Uh, so how things have changed. Uh, so I was nervous, but I got, I, I had a job interview uh, with the Bonneville Power Administration, which um, is a federal power marketing agency in the Portland area. And I had a really good interview with them. And so I was really excited and I was just like hope, hope, hoping that they would offer me a job in the finance department in the downtown Portland uh, headquarters. And that was gonna be the start of things for me. I was gonna learn about finance and maybe do finance and international business and the sky was gonna be the limit. Um, and so I did eventually get that call. It's the government, so it took a little while to get there, but I did get that call. And, uh, but instead of offering me a job in finance in the downtown headquarters building, uh, they offered me a job in power supply in Hazeldell. <laughs> now, I didn't know what the hell either one of those things were. <laughs> I'm like, but again, recession, 1992, I took the job. Or to paraphrase Robert Frost's famous poem, two jobs diverged in a forest. <laughs> I took the one in Hazeldell. <laughs> and it has made all the difference. And it really has made all the difference. I met my wife on that job. So way to go, Hazeldell. Way to go, way to go, Bonneville Power. I see you, Jennifer Miller, I love you. Um, so uh, I owe Bonneville and Hazeldell a lot. But uh, not only that, if we flash forward 30 years now, I am still in the energy field. I never did learn anything about finance. But I am still in the energy field and I love it. And here's why you should love it. And that is because energy matters. Um, this, uh, this picture is kind of like an image of energy at the heart of a solar system. And, uh, and, it, and that's how I look at energy. Energy touches almost every aspect of our lives. So when you think about how energy is produced, that can impact, that can create pollution, it can create, uh, it can add to climate change. 
if you think about where energy is produced, that can impact environmental justice, like what communities are being impacted by that production of energy. If you think about how much energy costs to produce, there, there's all sorts of social equity concerns about that. I mean, we've seen what's happening with inflation. People can't sometimes afford to both heat their homes and buy their medication. So there's all sorts of implications there. If you think about whether there is enough energy, that, has, uh, that can affect national security, but even beyond that, public safety, right? Because if you don't have electricity, when you need electricity, people can die. So there's a, there's a lot of different aspects that energy touches our lives on, and so getting energy policy right really matters. And um, you know, Nate talked about the takeaway. For you guys, for me, the takeaway is energy's worth learning about, and it's worth getting right. So, um, one of, the, one of the challenges of getting energy policy right is the challenge of unintended consequences. And I learned about that studying economics at Willamette, is the idea like in an economy, there are things that you want to change. And so if you're a policymaker, you have some levers that you can pull. Uh, and you can affect that one aspect of policy. But it's connected to all these other gears, and the gears don't always move in the same direction, and that can be a challenge. So we all just lived through, uh, we all just went through this experience with COVID and lockdowns, and the economy absolutely crashed, right? So what did the government do? The government jumped into action, and they spent a lot of money to spark the economy and to get people jobs, and actually that worked, right? So unemployment went down, um, the economy boomed, but what is the unintended consequence of that? What are we all dealing with today? Inflation. When the government spends a lot of money and all that money is in society, um, Prices tend to go up, so now we pay more for fuel and for food and for housing and all those things. That's a perfect example of an unintended consequence. Well, energy is very similar. When you think of these different cogs, these different gears kind of in the energy space, they all, um, they all spin. And by the way, this is really impressive. Watch this. This took me, <laughs> this, this actually took me like hours. I'm not, I'm not young anymore, so like, it was like I didn't have an IT dude, so I had to do this myself. But anyway, what you can see is uh, that when you turn one cog, let's say, for trying to get rid of pollution, that the other cogs might don't always move in the same direction. As a matter of fact, by, by nature, they don't. Uh, so when pollution goes down, then you can see that reliability also goes down, because you're, you're getting rid of coal plants, you're getting rid of natural gas plants, and that's great for fighting climate change. But now you have less energy available to uh, make sure that everyone has electricity when they need to, especially when you're replacing it with wind and solar power, which are intermittent. They're not always available. They're not available on demand. So a great example of that is shown in this chart here. Uh, and this actually came from uh, my old employer from the Bonneville Power Administration. And it shows all the wind generation in their service ter territory in the region over one week this last July. And it turned out to be a pretty warm week. It started off around 80 degrees, but we, it was one of the, as a matter of fact, I think we set the record for the most 100 degree days in Vancouver this year. Um, so anyway, what you see here, and this is very typical for wind generation, is that the wind uh, started off during the mild weather. Uh, we had a lot of electrons on the grid from wind generation. It was doing great. But as soon as it got hot, wind went to near zero. And it stayed there for three days. Now, if anyone likes electricity in their homes, that could be a problem, right? That is. A, that is it's, a, it's a really serious issue. That intermittency is a challenge. Um, and there, as I mentioned before, there are really pub there are huge public safety issues and I've worked for utilities all my life, so this is very near and dear to me. But there's huge public safety issues if you don't keep the grid reliable. And one of the, a great example is this. Back uh, just a year and a half ago, we were all here, or I think we were all here, I don't know you that well, but we were here, uh, and it was 116 degrees in Vancouver. Uh, it was the end of June, uh, end of June 2021, 116 degrees. No one, I, I certainly never thought that we would see anything like that uh, ever, but it happened. And over 500 people in the greater Northwest died of heat-related illnesses, um, many of them um, uh, from our senior population. Uh, so that, that was horrible. And I think if it hadn't been for everything that had been happening with COVID, that would still be a much, much bigger story. It's just incredible. Uh, but um, that happened with the grid operating as it should. Um, there were no blackouts in our region. The grid held firm. Imagine how much worse it would have been if all the electricity that cools our homes and our businesses and our schools had stopped flowing. 
would have been really serious. So, I mean, it was already really serious. It would have been even worse. So these kind of issues are really important, and this is one of the things that we have to look at when we're looking at our energy policy. The other challenge with the intermittency of the generation that we're bringing online with wind and solar power, and again, these are not bad sources of generation. They're really helpful for fighting climate change, but they have their limitations. So because they're intermittent, because they're not always available, you have to overbuild. You have to build so much. So over the next 20 years, we are supposed to build more renewable generation than we have ever in the, like the, the history of the world, the history of the planet. We are going to have to build more generation in the next 20 years than we've built over the last 115 years to get to a zero carbon grid. We're supposed to do that by 2045, but we will likely only get about halfway there. Um, and if we want to get to a fully decarbonized grid, it's probably going to take another 30 years. So we just flashed back to 1992, so we're talking about going from 2045 to 2075. That means millions and millions of extra tons of CO2 emissions in the atmosphere because it's going to take so long to build all those wind, wind plants and solar plants. So at this point in the talk, you are probably thinking, <laughs> you're probably thinking, what the heck? What did I sign up for? You know, we had Nate, and he had this amazing story about slaying dragons and being a champion. And I'm like, well, it's all on you. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. It's not on you. Um, the, the truth is that there are solutions, but I had to set up the challenge first. We had to determine who the dragon was before we could slay it. So. Uh, so um, we need resources like hydropower and nuclear power. And I'm going to talk about hydropower here. But uh, you need resources that are available 24 by 7 and are clean. And so um, a, an example of how hydropower works, you put a dam in a river, you fill, up, um, the, you fill up the area behind the river, the reservoir, with water. That water weighs a lot. If any of you have carried water around, water is heavy. It creates a lot of water pressure. When you choose to release it, past the hydroelectric turbine, it spins that turbine and it lights up a city. Did you guys see that? I made the city light up. So, yeah, I, I didn't want anyone to miss that. Thank you. I see you, Vancouver. Uh, so, absolutely. So, but you can do that with hydropower. You can do that again and again and again. It's a giant clean energy battery. We need resources like that. We need resources like nuclear power, a power that is on demand and can essentially what this does is it fills in those gaps for wind and solar power. They work really well together. But those are the kinds of things we need if we're actually going to achieve these clean energy goals. Most of our dams also have excellent fish passage. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so yes, look, look how happy, look how, ha are, don't you guys feel better? <laughs> so, so the truth is that we can do this. Uh, we can't be energy snobs, we can't be purists. A lot of people think, oh yeah, we just have to do it with wind, solar, and batteries. That's not going to work. It doesn't do any good to pass energy policies that are unachievable. So let's work together, and when I say we, I really do mean we. Um, there's an election coming up, and there's a whole bunch of people out there who would like you to vote for them. Um, and, you know, these folks, they're people pleasers, right? They want to know what their constituencies want. And as I think I've really demonstrated, well, like, energy matters. So if you go to the Clark County Elections website, you can see where these folks stand on a lot of different policies. We have people running for U.S. Senate, for the U.S. House of Representatives, for Clark County Commissioner, and uh, even for the Commission of Clark Public Utilities. You know, do they have a, do they have a plan for us to get to uh, both a clean energy future, but also a safe and reliable energy future, and an affordable energy future. All those things matter, and those are the things that we should be focused on. So, um, as I mentioned, other than just being uh, sorbet for your evening, I also, I also really do love energy. And so I would, I would welcome for any of you guys to reach out. Uh, my email address is on there. It's Kurt with a K. Uh, at nwriverpartners.org. And anyway, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you for laughing at my jokes. Appreciate it. Bye. Mike. Thank you.